I posted in the chat section um, a eulogy for Rabbi Lamb that I published in the Jewish Press this past week, and uh, it as well has a, a brief tshuva Rabbi Lamb wrote me that I published, and I posted as well the article that we're going to talk about today entitled um, The Religious Implications of Extraterrestrial Life. Um, uh, Rabbi Lamb's longest article of the 1960s, um, one of the longer articles tradition ever published, um, is this article. Um, and um, I can't tell if it's a dated article or its time has not yet um, arrived, um, but I guess I want to start uh, by just uh, reviewing, uh, and then we'll move on to this article itself. As I've explained in the last uh, three classes, uh, the esteem with which I hold Rabbi Lamb is um, enormous. He was four things to me. Um, he was uh, an enormous scholar, a person whose scholarship will survive many generations and be used in hundreds of years. He was um, a profound religious leader. Um, he was a communal leader who um, built um, institutions when none existed from the Morasha, uh, from Camp Morasha to tradition to many new things at Yeshiva University and so much more. And um, Rabbi Lamb was, as I note in the um, Jewish press piece, he was an intellectual diplomat. He was a synthesizer of various views who very much believed in the truth of uncertainty and compromise. He was a person who went among competing schools of thought. And um, I find that very worthwhile and important. And this particularly comes out in uh, this article, which, you know, at first glance, we tend to shrug these things off and say, what are the implications of extraterrestrial life? But I want to say three things about why this article is important. Um, the first reason why it's important is because you see vintage Rabbi Lamb thinking with you about what's really important in Judaism. Second of all, you see Rabbi Lamb acknowledge uncertainty. And the third thing you see in Rabbi Lamb is this consistent focus on what really is the central purpose of Judaism. And um, Rabbi Lamb lays out for you here um, what he thinks is really going on in Judaism. And, um, and in that sense, it's important. Let me contrast Rabbi Lamb's um, view um, where Rabbi Lamb says, I mean, we'll come to it at some length, but more or less Rabbi Lamb says, there could be extraterrestrial life. Uh, I don't really know. Um, but it, uh, here's how it integrates into Judaism. Um, this stands in contrast to uh, an older contemporary of Rabbi Lamb, Rabbi Avigdor Miller. Rabbi Avigdor Miller also went to Yeshiva University. He was a few years ahead of Rabbi Lamb, um, but um, Rabbi uh, Victor Miller was a person who always saw everything in black and white. Um, and um, when he was asked about extraterrestrial life, Rabbi Miller said as follows, they are spending millions of dollars. This is what he said in the 1960s, the same time Rabbi Lamb wrote this article from taxes which we pay to investigate this matter because they believe that if life came about on our own world, then why not on other worlds as there are millions of other worlds? But that did not happen because in order to have life, you have to have an endless amount of detail in an exact way. The fact that we live in this world is the most obvious proof that there is a Hashem. And considering the huge number of details required, it's hard to believe but they also exist somewhere else. Therefore, there is no doubt that no life exists on other planets. Rabbi Victor Miller stakes his Judaism on 
uh, the idea that um, there is no other extraterrestrial life. And this is the most common view within the Orthodox tradition, which is the uniqueness of our relationship with God um, mandates that uh, we exist to the exclusion of everybody else. And, um, and um, it, other life on other planets would profoundly undermine. Essentially, Rabbi Lamb uh, won't take that view. Rabbi Lamb starts this article in what I consider the kind of deep Rabbi Lamb analysis of the secular material. Rabbi Lamb, who you see here, a man of science, although he didn't spend much of his adult life in it, um, he was not a Judaic studies major in Yeshiva College, he was a chemistry major, he went off to do um, graduate work at Brooklyn Poly in physical chemistry, um, and he was deeply comfortable um, with the scientific world, and he opens um, with a thorough review of what the scientists are saying and what are the possibilities and um, and um, why it's possible there could be life on other planets. And he's not dismissive. He doesn't say um, what so many others around him said, which is, um, it's clear from the Genesis story that we are the pinnacle of creation. And if we are the pinnacle of creation, then there cannot be any other life anywhere else, because how can we be the pinnacle of creation if there's lots of other life someplace else? Uh, a very uh, rabbinic approach. There, there cannot be any other life because our relationship with God makes us the pinnacle of creation. And since we are the pinnacle of creation, it means that there's no other pinnacles out there. Um, Rabbi Lamb steadfastly refuses to do this. And um, I want to explain why. Rabbi Lamb is not prepared to stake his um, religious existence on a view that many, many, many scientists dispute. He understands um, that there might be other life. Um, and it might be that as we are entering the great world of the 1970s, we're beginning to start the process of communicating with other planets, and maybe it will turn out that there is other life. And Rabbi Lamb thinks it's exceptionally unwise um, to stake your vision of uh, rabbinic Judaism on a model that the scientists think is not necessarily true. So Rabbi Lamb, after thoroughly reviewing the matter, um, says, uh, it, there's a sense of science that there's a possibility that there's other there and it's not to be dismissed. Um, and you can't just announce that Judaism has resolved a scientific dispute. Rabbi Lamb recognizes that the existence of life on other planets is either a fact or not a fact. And since it's either a fact or not a fact, um, you can't by rabbinic will determine these facts. Of course, he's aware of Drake's calculation and he's aware of, uh, of Fermi's observation. He's aware of all of these issues, but Rabbi Lamb, um, ever thoughtful about the reality around him, um, is insistent that you can't resolve a scientific dispute um, by quoting to me a medrash. And um, you shouldn't stake your Judaism on one side or another of an ongoing scientific dispute because you never know how it's going to work out. Um, and I heard myself, Rabbi Lamb, in the 1980s remark that how silly the Malbim looked. Um, by staking his vision of Horatius on Lamarckian evolution, and that it's exceptionally unwise to look at a current scientific dispute and tell me how it will be resolved by dint of looking at Chazal. It's a bad idea. Rabbi Lamb 
um, acknowledges that there is an ongoing scientific dispute about whether or not it's statistically possible, statistically likely, or even statistically very probable that there's other intelligent life out there. Um, and he's aware of the ongoing conversations starting really from the 1940s about the likelihood and probability of this. It's just getting started in the 1960s when Rabbi Lamb wrote, but Rabbi Lamb's aware of it. He's familiar with the literature, he's familiar with the math, and he's familiar with the science. Um, and let me add something else. Rabbi Lamb is also a scientific skeptic. What do I mean by that? Um, Rabbi Lamb is incessantly careful here, and he reminds us that Torah Jews um, need to distinguish between data and speculation, and that even though we as Torah Jews have to follow scientific knowledge, we don't have to line ourselves up um, with current scientific speculations. Um, and um, Rabbi Lamb um, remarks here, and this is the first time he does so, but he does it a few other times in other pieces of scholarship on what he calls the fallacy of transferred authority. And Rabbi Lamb's quote is very nice. Most other scientists, departing from their chosen disciplines and donning the robe of the philosopher, are far less humble. Some, as have been mentioned, have enthusiastically adopted what Bush not the President Bush, but the scientist Bush, has called the new materialism. Harlow Shepley, eminent in his own domain, has gone further than most others, suffering from what has been called the fallacy of transferred authority. Shapley has declared that we are peripheral, has found intimations of man's inconsequentiality, and proceeded to recommend the philosophy which will attempt to guide a man in a universe in which he is essentially a nobody. Rabbi Lamb, after thoroughly reviewing the science, pointing out the possibility, the possibilities, reminds the intelligent Torah reader um, not to believe everything they, ra they read. It's nice when you tell me a person has a PhD in microbiology and now they're going to take a crack at, um, at uh, the physics of cosmology. Rabbi Lamb says you rightfully have to be extremely skeptical of the fallacy of transferred authority. And we all know, Rabbi Lamb says, that no matter um, what the math is, um, we know the following observed reality. The year is 1964 when Rabbi Lamb is writing, and the year is now 2020, a full uh, um, almost 60 years after Rabbi Lamb wrote, and the data is clear. We have encountered no extraterrestrial life at all, or as Fermi observes, where are they? A meaning notwithstanding all the great literature written in the 1950s and the 1960s about how likely intelligent life is, there are billions of planets and there are millions of, of habitable planets, and even if only one in every million becomes intelligent, there should be 26 million planets out there full of intelligent life. Um, we have seen none of it, Rabbi Lamb reminds us, and it's still quite possible that we're all it is, and that there is nobody out there besides us. Um, on the other hand, Rabbi Lamb is honest. He acknowledges the possibility um, that it's not just us and that there are um, other intelligent planets out there and we haven't encountered them, but at some point in the future, us Earthlings will encounter other highly intelligent life and will acknowledge their existence. Rabbi Lamb, you know, he, he refuses to resolve the scientific dispute in any significant way. Um, he does acknowledge um, three points. There's considerable, um, expert opinion that there's a possibility that there's extraterrestrial life. There are lots of scientists out there who would like to believe this because it reduces humans to inconsequentiality and they like that. Um, and we have not yet encountered any extraterrestrial life at all. 
leaving this as a question. And then Rabbi Lamb explains the challenge. He gets the problem and is honest about it. What if there really is highly intelligent life out there? Um, uh, is that, uh, at its core, an argument um, like a group of scientists advanced, Shapley is the leader of them in the 1950s, that if there really is extraterrestrial life out there, that's a proof that all religion is nonsense. That's essentially what Rabbi Lamb is dealing with. There's an argument out there in the scientific community which says, um, if there are many, many, many um, uh, worlds out there, then it must be that there is no God and we're all a scientific accident. And um, Rabbi Lamb takes that on directly. That is the issue that Rabbi Lamb wants to address frontally, which is, I don't know, he says, if there's other intelligent life out there. There's some scientific speculation that there could be, and there's some evidence that it's statistically possible that it could exist, but we have encountered none of it. But how does the rabbinic tradition address the possibility of extraterrestrial life? And as I noted before, Rabbi Lamb shrugs off. Everybody who's written about this for the last 70 years, from let's say 1880 until he's writing in 1960, who says, of course it can't be because humans are the pinnacle of creation. Rabbi Lamb will not accept that view because he knows that that might turn out to be religious suicide because there might very well be extraterrestrial life out there and he doesn't want to stake his version of Judaism on a data point that might be proven empirically false. Rabbi Lamb starts um, with a very, very, very important point. Um, and I want to say it in its strongest form. And Rabbi Lamb says it in the same strong form. The rabbis um, went out of their way to be as uncertain as they could about the creation story. Um, they did not believe in the literalism of the book of Beratius. They did not believe in the uniqueness of the Beratius creation. Edrish is incessant that there were worlds before our world. Um, the rabbis were as clear as they could, as they reasonably could be, to insist that the Beratius story um, is a homily and not a scientific cookbook. I want to contrast this. Um, with a movement that Rabbi Lamb isn't familiar with because it hadn't taken shape in the 1960s, but which he takes aim at without giving it an exact name. The evangelical Christian community believes in both the inerrancy and the literacy, the litera literalness of Chumash. Rabbi Lamb's point is extremely important. We believe in the inerrancy of Chumash. We believe that Torah is absolutely, totally true. But we do not believe in any way, shape, or form that the literal Torah is true. And we don't believe that we take literal steps in the creation process in any sort of a serious way. Rabbi Lamb demonstrates medrash after medrash um, that, um, that the rabbis said, don't take the Beratia story so seriously. Don't invest in the details. Be content in the belief that there were worlds before Beratius. Rabbi Lamb observes in one of the notes that if you believe that there were worlds before Beratius, there's no reason to believe that there weren't worlds after the creation of Earth. Um, there is no clear Midrashic source that all the worlds after Earth were destroyed or all the worlds before Earth were destroyed. We have an elaborate veiled Genesis story. The rabbis were not like the modern Christian evangelicals who insisted on the literalism of the Beratius story. Um, the rabbis never articulated the belief that the dating of the world that we use is to be taken uh, literally. They never took the idea that Adam and Eve were the first and only human beings literally. They recognized that there were worlds before our world. Um, they recognized the possibility that there were worlds after our worlds, 
All of this flows, Rabbi Lamb observes, from the following basic idea. God exists um, independent of the creation of the earth, and you don't have to believe um, that um, God exists because we exist. There's something, uh, I will say it this way, there's something very uh, Rabbi Heschel about this, and Rabbi Lamb doesn't feel this way. Um, God exists because God exists. It's our mission to serve God. It's not God's mission to serve us. And if you told me that after God created Earth, he created 36 other planets, Rabbi Lamb would say could be. And if you told me that before God created Earth, he created 5,762 other Earths, um, Rabbi Lamb would say could be. Um, we have no data and no commitment to the uniqueness of Earth, and the Midrashim are full of sequential or parallel or post-Earth universes. I want to summarize Rabbi Lamb's very important point um, with the phrase, who cares? Rabbi Lamb's point is as follows. We have no rabbinic tradition promising us the uniqueness of existence, we have no rabbinic tradition which promises us that human beings are the closest thing to God in this world, in, in this universe. We have no commitment to the idea that the creation of Earth is unique or without parallel and couldn't be created elsewhere in some other way. If I told Rabbi Lamb that the Star Trek series that's out there um, is true, and there were many other planets out there far, far away with human-like people on it, Rabbi Lamb would say, could be. And when I ask Rabbi Lamb who created those other universes, Rabbi Lamb says directly, of course God did. These aren't proof of the lack of existence of God. These are proofs of the existence of God and the wisdom of the Talmudic stories. And I'll go even further for a minute. Um, Rabbi Lamb would claim as follows. These Talmudic stories, these medrashim of parallel universes and prior universes and post-universes, all of them reflect the divinity of Chazal at some level, which is without any basis at all in the year zero, they intuited the idea that there were many planets and many, many, many intelligent uh, universes out there as a possibility. Rabbi Lamb is not in the least bit bothered um, by the existence of multiple universes and multiple humans and uh, all sorts of other uh, possibilities. This, this doesn't bother Rabbi Lamb. Rabbi Lamb not only isn't bothered by it, he goes out of his way to highlight um, the Medrash, the, not the Medrash, the Medrashim, the countless Medrashim um, that, um, that highlight for us the idea um, that, uh, that there were many, many, many planets. Um, and Rabbi Lamb doesn't spend a lot of time on it, but I, I will for a minute. I like the fact that, that Rabbi Lamb makes mention of the fact that the mystical tradition is particularly into this. Um, and this is very important, I will say, because as Rabbi Lamb notes, um, the mystics tend to be the most anthrocentric. But here, they're consciously very not anthrocentric. And as Rabbi Lamb points out in an article that's almost an intellectual prequel to this article that he published a, a few years earlier, um, um, the Rambam and Rav Sadia Gaon duked it out almost a century ago about a very basic question in the Jewish tradition that Rabbi Lamb points out is really a fight between Aristotle and Plato um, and turns into a fight between Rambam and Sadia going, which is, is man at the center or man at the bottom or man at the top? Um, Aristotle and the Rambam adopt one view and Sadia going and Plato adopt another view. I'm going to make the following claim which I think Rabbi Lamb agrees with, uh, which is that Aristotle and the Rambam make the same claim because Aristotle was aware, I'm sorry, because the Rambam was aware it was the Aristotelian view. 
I'm not sure that we're prepared to make the claim that Rosadja Gon was aware of it being Plato's view or not. It could be that Rosadja Gon was aware of it being Plato's view. I'm not 100% sure. I know that the academics are convinced that Rosadja Gon did not have Plato. I'm not 100% sure that he didn't have some version of Plato through the Arabic philosophers around him. But more or less, here's how it goes. Aristotle is of the view um, that um, that the creation of man um, uh, need not be the pinnacle of creation. And while the Rambam make, makes note of the fact that Aristotle doesn't make a full claim and he himself rejects the full claim of Aristotle, uh, or he doesn't think Aristotle makes the full claim, more or less, the point goes as follows. Um, man is, man, I don't mean man, people. People are not necessarily the primary purpose of creation. And it's true, Rav Sajagon and Plato think that people are the central purpose of creation, but it, it, it's not intuitive in the rabbinic tradition at all that people are the central purpose of creation. People were created and we worship God and um, uh, God has a special relationship with the Jewish people, but um, Rabbi Lamb's point goes as follows. The Rambam is pretty clear that we could acknowledge the possibility that God has a relationship with other people at other places and other planets. And I'll go even further. He may be even with other nations on this planet. But even if you're not prepared to go that far, and I know that that's a far plank to go down, the idea that um, people are not the pinnacle of creation um, lays out very distinct possibilities for a God that created other universes and other planets and, um, and is a deity in more than one universe, like sort of the King of England is not just the King of England, but was for many years the King of India and the King of Ireland and the King of Scotland and the King of France and uh, carries many different titles. God might be the creator of our universe and the creator of other universes. And there could be parallel enslavement on other planets and God heard their cries and freed them and chose other people. Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that um, we don't have a very firm rabbinic tradition about the anthropocentric nature of human existence. Although he doesn't directly make any mention of, he of Heschel, the idea that God needs the Jews as much as the Jews need God is a very Rabbi Heschel idea. And Rabbi Lamb clearly is taking aim at that idea. Rabbi Lamb thinks that God doesn't need us at all. We need God. And our relationship with God is like a watchman of God's good things. Um, and as I said before in his article on ecology, God of this universe that God created, and as I noted in the class before that, God thinks we're the watchmen of the bodies God gave us. And as I said in the Satmer class last week, God thinks we are the watchmen of the land of Israel. But Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that don't confuse the fact that God assigns us tasks. Um, and our need to do those tasks with the fact that God needs us to do those tasks. That's a common error, the, sa uh, the Ra uh, Rabbi Lamb says. And Rabbi Lamb is prepared to note um, that you don't have to adopt that view. There are some Jewish philosophers who adopt that view, and there are some Rishonim who adopt that view. But it's not the dominant view. And it's not um, a view that you have to... It's not our Alamo. Some religious faiths, Rabbi Lamb averred, have made the uniqueness of human existence an Alamo, and that we have no chance to survive if there's life on other planets um, that are more intelligent than ours, because we are the pinnacle of creation. Rabbi Lamb refuses to adopt that view. Rabbi Lamb has um, a view that I think is very, um, honest, which is um, the common Jewish tradition, Rabbi Lamb says, the, the view of the typical Jew on the street is, is that earth is the pinnacle of creation, P 
people are the pinnacle of God's creation and Jews are the pinnacle of God's creation of human beings, which is an awfully nice way um, um, to view it for yourself. And it's nice to pat yourself on the back as a Jew to say God created the whole world and he created people as special and then he created Jews as special and we are the special of the special. But Rabbi Lamb's point is um, that um, it's important for us to view ourselves that way because it gives us a sense of responsibility and it generates upon us uh, a broad sense of responsibility for others around us. Um, and it gives us a sense of um, we are the watchmen of our community with responsibility towards lesser creatures. Um, and that Rabbi Liam thinks that this creates an important um, moral impetus to charity, um, to good deeds, to watching others around us. Um, um, and, and that Rabbi Lamb thinks that that's an excellent thing for a person to go around thinking. Um, but you don't have to adopt that thought process as, if you'll excuse me, the God-given truth. The God-given truth could be that we are the most intelligent human being, we are the most intelligent beings we have encountered. And since we are the most intelligent beings we have encountered, um, we being deeply religious good people undertake the moral responsibility to the world around us to the best of our ability because being a good person, um, we do our very best to make the world a good place because as far as we can tell, uh, we are the pinnacle of creation as we see it. And that's enough. And that's enough. Um, and of course, we represent that as we must be in charge. But Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that that's a proper way to delegate this. Um, but it doesn't have to actually be so. When a, a five-year-old feels a sense of responsibility for watching their three-year-old, that's very good. And the five-year-old really, really, really has to be imbued with a sense of important authority, which is you're in a year old watch your sibling. Um, you're in charge, do a good job. God wants you to do the best you can. But that doesn't make the five-year-old um, the center of the universe. It just makes the five-year-old think that they're the center of the universe. And that's very, very, very important pedagogically and religiously and it's designed to ensure that everybody behaves their very, very, very best. Our relationship with God is predicated on our believing that we are in charge. Um, um, and that that's a very, very, very important idea. But Rabbi Lamb is content with the idea that there might be more to it than we see. Um, um, that's an, a very important idea. I'm going to give you the quote at the end of the article. It's not the exact end. The Bible is not an engineering manual nor a science textbook. It does not seek to describe the steps or means by which God created. Its, it's aim in Genesis is to assert that God is he who brought all into being and that certain moral and religious consequences flow therefrom. As Rabbi Cook has pointed out, it is an aspect of biblical style to attribute the end product to the one who is ultimately responsible for it, while overlooking all intermediate steps as secondary. Rabbi Lamb's point is, of course, God writes a Genesis story, a Beratius story, that lets us think that we're the most important thing, because God wants to assign to us um, the idea that um, we need to be responsible human beings. If we thought that there were more intelligent beings around us, we would tend to be irresponsible, counting on a rescue, like children who know their parent will um, help them when they jump off the, their chair, jump off the chair, counting on their parents to dive in and save them. God doesn't want us to behave that way. This is very, very, very consistent with Rabbi Lamb's worldview, which is the purpose of Torah is to empower human beings to be the best they can. And then um, Rabbi Lamb says harder. The discovery, the next paragraph, the discovery of fellow intelligent creatures elsewhere in the universe 
if indeed they do exist, will deepen and broaden our appreciation of the mysteries of the Creator and His creation. Rabbi Lamb says man, but he doesn't really mean man. He's writing in the 1960s, I would say people will be humble, but not humiliated. With renewed fervor, uh, we will be able to turn to God whose infinite goodness and providence are not limited to, but certainly include one small planet on the fringes of the Milky Way. We may yet learn that as rational, science, sentient, and self-conscious creatures, we are not alone. But then again, we have never felt before any need that we feel today or in the future that we are alone, for thou art with me. This is Rabbi Lamb's final paragraph here. Rabbi Lamb um, deeply grabs the idea that the human companionship is with God. We draw sustenance and reward and support, not from the idea that we are the masters of our universe. That's the end of Rabbi Lamb's view. Rabbi Lamb's view is we are subservient to God in our universe, and we are not alone, not because there are Martians or other people. There could be other people. We are not alone because God is with us, and God commands us to do good and be a, a proper human being. Rabbi Lamb, um, maybe the grandest Jewish philosopher of the last half of the 20th century, between this article and Torah Umada and a few other uh, philosophical articles he's written, gets it distinctly right. The Jewish tradition is not about our exact physical place in the universe. It's not about are we the pinnacle of God's creation, not at all. It's about our moral place and our relationship with God, the presence of other God-worshiping creatures or creatures who should become God-worshiping creatures ahead of us or behind us in the evolutionary chain matters not at all. If we find another planet with more intelligent human beings, we should try to persuade them of the basic truth of, to of Torah and mitzvot, and if we find creatures of lesser uh, technical ability than ours, we should do the exact same theme thing. It's not a theme of Judaism that we are unique. It's a theme of Judaism that um, God is above us and commands us um, to be good people. It's our relationship with God that is central and other peoples on other planets and other peoples on this planet need to develop that exact relationship um, with God. Um, I wrote the following paragraph to myself as I was preparing notes and I wanna read it to you and then open for comments. Can I be honest? I would have made Rabbi Lamb president of Yeshiva University based just on this one article alone. This article places Judaism, Torah, and Halacha where it belongs, on a religious plane and seeking God, not on a physical plane discussing what kind of protein soup did God use to create the universe, and not whether we were first, second, third, or 6,547th of the soup, and whether or not there are other soups out there. Rabbi Lamb here hit the nail really on the head in terms of what's our purpose. Our purpose is to develop a moral relationship with God and God's creatures everywhere, following the basic ethical principles that God outlines in Torah and mitzvot. We are God's agents. It's possible God has other agents to do good. Why should God only delegate to us, Rabbi Lamb um, says. Um, not at all. Um, Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that, um, um, is that um, our relationship with God is central, but our relationship with God is unique from our perspective. We have no other gods. But that's not the same as a commitment on God's part to have a unique relationship with us. God can have other children um, on other planets for sure. And I just want to note as follows, just as a footnote, uh, 
not that Rabbi Lamb needs any validation from me, but I'm going to validate Rabbi Lamb's approach from a quote from Rabbi Soloveitchik written 15 years after, um, after um, Rabbi Lamb wrote this piece. Rabbi Soloveitchik was speaking about this matter. The year was 1978. And this is just a quote from the Rav. The Rav didn't write it. He was just speaking. And somebody asked the Rav about what he thought about extraterrestrials. And the Rav said it as follows. He, quote, he quotes Rabbi Lamb verbatim intellectually. It is possible that Hashem created other life forms on other planets. It is no problem to Yahadut. The reason man likes to think he is only created, he's the only created being in the entire universe is because of his egotistical nature. Even the concept of Am and Nivchar may only be relative to our world, our small section of the universe. The Torah is written from the viewpoint of our sun, moon, and stars. It would not detract one bit um, if there were other planet, if there were other people. Um, this is, um, it would not detract from our being an Am and Nivchar of this region of space if there are other Am and Nivchar in a distant galaxy. Um, Rabbi Soloveitchik, who certainly and absolutely had read Rabbi Lamb's article, in conversation without citing Rabbi Lamb, adopts Rabbi Lamb's thesis and expresses it as obviously correct. This is because Rabbi Lamb's thesis is, in my view, not obviously correct, because lots of great Jewish law authorities didn't get it, and not because it was obviously correct, because all the great minds of the last half of the 20th century got it, because many did not. It's obviously correct, because when you stop and think about it and spend some time on it, you see that Rabbi Lamb has hit the nail on the head and has completely articulated the right view. Once again, Rabbi Lamb has articulated an elegant approach to a philosophical problem in valuable ways. Rabbi, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes, we hear you well. It's great to I, see you. Uh, I, have a, to I have a comment on today's, if we're taking comments later on. Please. Uh, yes. Rabbi Shurson um, was asked the same question. He basically said the same thing. I just checked the quote. Wonderful. Uh, and, and I think that's interesting as well. Good. Um, yes, that's correct. The Lubavitch Rebbe took the same view. Maybe he took it from Rabbi Lamb as well. Could be. Shalom, how are you doing? It's so nice of you to join our class. I'm doing very well. I very I much apologize that I had not muted myself at the very beginning. I uh, apologize to everyone, but at the same time, uh, I was fortunate enough to know Dr. Lamb uh, very, very well and uh, uh, assure everybody that he was as, as spectacular at home as he was uh, lecturing. It's uh, the greatest honor of a lifetime. I didn't say this this time, but I've said in a few other times that uh, Rabbi Lamb was a wonderful family man. I should say it more intensely. Shalom is his son. Which uh, one, are there many sons or is this... How many? Uh, so there are three of us remaining, and um, we are very close, very adoring of my parents, uh, and greatly honored by uh, Rabbi Broyd's wonderful lectures. Uh, they are a tour de force, magnificent, and uh, they're really quite wonderful. Thank you so much. You're so kind. I'm ever indebted to your father and your family. That's the truth. Guy, how are you doing? Can't hear you. I'm okay. I just have a question for you. Sure. So um, what if God reveals himself to other worlds and says, well, they say that there's more than one God? No, we, we're not polytheists. We would deny any polytheistic so we'll, tradition. So we'll, Can't be. Can't be. OK. Elliot, how are you doing? OK, thanks. What's the predominant view today among scholars? Is it more like Rabbi Lamb? Or more like uh, Rabbi, uh, was it Sadna Gaon? Was that the, you were? Uh, more like Rabbi, I mean, Rabbi Victor Miller is of the view that yeah, there can't be other like universes. I, 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 you know, I have a confession to make. I don't count uh, right. uh, contemporary authorities. I think most people are philosophical ninnies. So, of course, most people like to believe in the uniqueness of human beings. So, I'm sure if we went from great Torah scholar the great Torah scholar, they wouldn't be in Rabbi Lamb's camp, but that's because they're ninnies. 
Because I don't think randomly philosophical. Yeah. Too it would be devastating. It would be like you said. It would be devastating for them if they, it turns out there are there are yes. extraterrestrial, right? I would, I agree with that. Yes, it would be devastating. Susie, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. I also have a question. You said early on that the rabbis considered gray sheet to be not literal. Were yes. Story. How far do they take that? Just through the one story? Through you, the you, have to, you have to distinguish between the question of inerrancy and literacy and literalness. Um, none of the Torah needs to be taken literally. Okay? Um, in inerrancy means God dictated it to Moshe, but sometimes the Torah speaks in hyperbole. So I want to, I always ask the Ibn Ezra's question, did Paro speak Hebrew? The answer is no, Paro spoke Egyptian. So when the Torah records conversations between Moshe and Paro in Hebrew, these are not the exact translations. These are not the exact conversations. They spoke in Egyptian. Rather, the Torah represents, and, and, uh, and you don't have to believe that these are the literal words, not at all. So all of Torah can be understood um, non-literally when it comes to the stories. You don't have to believe that the stories happened exactly as described ever and in any situation. You do have to believe that God transcribed them in this way, but that doesn't mean that, that the, the stories occurred in any sort of literal way at all. Um, Rhonda asked me if Rambam takes the non-literalism of, of Torah all the way through all of Chumash, and the answer is yes. But in truth, so does Rashi. Rashi sometimes gives non-literal explanations to Torah. Nobody's a literalist. Nobody is a literalist. It, it's one thing to believe that the literal Torah was given letter by letter from God to Moshe. I believe that. But that doesn't mean I have to take the literal meaning of every single word exactly correctly so. Those are two very, very, very different concepts. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure Thank to hear you, from Michael. you. I look forward to seeing you next week.